Kape and welcome to Coconut Chats, everyone. Today you've got me, Harita, and today I'm joined with Shomita. How are you doing, Shomita? I'm good, Harita. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Today we've got a guest from Australia. Um, Joseph is a South Asian young professional who currently serves as the project director for Reach Across. That's an international nonprofit. And in his spare time, he loves to read, travel, and write for several culture-centric publications, including mm. the South Asian Philanthropy Project, Desi Musings, and India Spora, amongst many others. He also serves on the Youth Advisory Council for the United States Consulate General and was recently the Multicultural Ambassador for the Mental Health Foundation of Australia. And he's also a Youth Ambassador for People Against Poverty. That's a bit of a mouthful to say, and I'm stunned by all the things you're involved in. Welcome, Joseph. How are you? Yeah, doing well. Thanks for having me, Rita. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. So there's a lot that we'd like to cover with you today. So we'll get started. Um, what inspired you to get involved with Reach Across and tell our listeners a bit more about what they do? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, Reach Across is, is an international nonprofit, uh, like you mentioned in the introduction. Um, I got involved with them about... Uh, two years ago, uh, when I first heard about them online, I was just doing research after my uh, international development degree, uh, which I graduated from a few years ago. And I was just really interested in kind of connecting what I had studied with, I guess, more practical experience in the field. Um, so actually the international director at the time was based in the UK and he actually flew out to Australia to, to recruit me. So um, it was a bit of an interesting um, journey, not, not your typical recruitment uh, sort of role, but yeah, I really was interested in, in kind of getting more involved on a practical level. So that's when I first started with Reach Across. Um, this was uh, the end of 2019. Um, so since then, just been um, serving as the project director, basically assisting refugees and migrants uh, here in Australia to get uh, settled in and connected with with their local community and basically to support them with different services and and really get connected with with other cultures as well um, and different people who can assist them in that regard okay um yeah joseph uh we came across that you held a fundraising dinner recently for ethiopia so do you want the listeners uh, to give a brief about what was the cause and how did it go? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, every year we, we focus on a different country uh, where we work in as, as the organization Reach Across. So last year uh, was our first uh, annual fundraising dinner where we were raising funds for obviously the COVID crisis in India, which a lot of people heard about the news. Uh, so we're raising funds for some of our workers in um, in North India. And this year, uh, we were focusing on Ethiopia, mainly because um, Ethiopia was actually the first country Reach Across started in uh, internationally. Uh, and there is a quite, quite a big uh, population or community of Ethiopian refugees here in Brisbane, which not many people know about. So we just wanted to kind of highlight different um, people from the community here. So... Uh, we held that uh, last Saturday, and it was really great. We had some guest speakers from Ethiopia share their story um, about being refugees coming over to Australia and kind of starting their own businesses. Um, the whole event was catered by Ethiopian uh, restaurant, and then we had like authentic food, and then we had other people from other nonprofits um, kind of share about their work and and um, support sign up, uh, kind of our fundraising efforts in that regard. So. So that's what we were holding the fundraiser for. And um, yeah, it was great to see a lot of different cultures uh, come come together and support, not just Indians, but uh, Pakistani, Sri Lankan community, and obviously the African community as well. So it was really great. Yeah, uh, one question here. So uh, when you raise the fund and you reach out to the people in the respective countries, so do you have an office there or a group of volunteers working or you collaborate with some other organizations that are uh, working in those respective countries? 
Yeah, that's a good question. So a bit of both. Um, so for example, in India last year, we didn't have anyone directly working in a reach across office per se, um, but we recruited uh, some of the locals in the community who are already working with refugees from Bangladesh up in the north. Uh, and then that, they identified a need and then we developed a project with the locals. So that's what we usually do, which is typically not what many um, international nonprofits do. Um, so we don't specifically have to have a a physical office uh, in the country we work with. Uh, but some countries we do like Ethiopia, mainly because we've been working there since the inception of Reach Across. Um, but all of the, the workers in Ethiopia are locals. Uh, so we only recruit locals and they kind of oversee the work. And whenever we raise funds, like for our fundraising dinners here, um, it's always to support what, whatever they're doing already. Um, so that's how we usually we operate. Mm, that's really good. So how many years ago did Reach Across actually begin? So Reach Across has started in 1952. Oh, wow. So, um, yeah, so it's been around for a while, um, a lot longer than me. But um, basically, yeah, it was it was kind of interesting to me about, obviously, how the organization expanded from Africa and then kind of um, internationally um as well. So, so when it first came to Australia, it was about uh, 20 or 30 years ago. Um, but every country, like I mentioned, has a different focus. So obviously here in Australia, because there's so many international migrants and people from, from refugee backgrounds coming to Australia, we re really wanted to be able to support them. And although there are a lot of nonprofits that do that already, there's no specific one focusing on you know, local engagement in terms of how can we connect people who are already here back to their communities back home and sort of facilitate that connection. So, so that's what we try to do. Um, and we do partner with, with others in this space who are, who are either running similar organizations or who are already migrants and refugees and have their own businesses or nonprofits. So we try and be pretty intentional about that. Um, and, and I guess, yeah, the, the work that we do kind of reflects that as well. So on the Reach Across Australia website, I noticed that um, the low levels of recycling within Australia were mentioned. So how does this tie in to the other type of work that Reach Across does? And what initiatives are Reach Across doing to encourage the recycling numbers to increase? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, late last year, we, we were kind of thinking about how can we I guess, be more involved locally, kind of start new initiatives that people can get involved in within their own communities here in Australia to support um, our work. So um, a few years ago, actually, the Australian government started um, an initiative called Containers for Change, which is basically an um, initiative where recyclable plastics uh, can be um, donated back to, to, I guess, recycling plants. And there's usually two ways that you can do it, which we've kind of adapted as well, which we've called our Change for Change program. So people can recycle either uh, plastic bottles or Coke cans, things like that. Um, and they have an option either to um, hand it back to the recycling centers where you get 10 cents per can or bottle that you recycle. Um, but the way that we do it is they can either keep the money or they can donate it back to Reach Across and then we send it to our, our international operations. So it's a way for people to get more conscious about recycling um, while still contributing to obviously um, a bigger cause. So, so we've been running that since last year. And yeah, we've got a lot of different groups involved, other nonprofits are supporting us. And um, we tie that into obviously other um, recycling efforts that we do like Clean Up Australia Day. Um, and, and other efforts that we're doing in the community. But we have recycled yeah, hundreds of, of recyclables since we started the program and, and we've been able to raise a significant amount of money since. So yeah, it's been, it's been really great to see the community kind of get involved in that as well. Yep, that's really sounds great. Um, so how many countries uh, is, uh, do you guys have active uh, office and volunteers from Reach Across around the world? Yeah, so we're uh, located in about uh, 10 countries across the world um, in five continents. Um, so, yeah, obviously we start in Africa. Our headquarters internationally is in the UK. And then we also have offices in the US, Canada, um, Germany, uh, Australia and New Zealand. So 
we've been we've been kind of strategically placed in, in different locations to to reach out to to neighboring countries as well so obviously australia we're reaching out to new zealand and we are planning to start um operation in indonesia um and some of the islands in the pacific obviously because australia is in very close proximity to to those countries but yeah really identifying whatever needs are in the community and seeing which countries we haven't really reached out to yet and see if we can do something to support them as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, if I uh, ask you like any uh, upcoming interesting projects that you would like to talk about? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so like I said, Indonesia has been a country we've been focusing on for quite some time to start something. So um, in some of the islands, they're very remote. So obviously they don't have access to, to certain Uh, services or support structures that you know countries like Australia have um, you know obviously such as like clean water or access to produce things like that so uh, a lot of the things that we've been focusing on is obviously like youth empowerment education um, starting community uh, development initiatives to support you know vulnerable families stuff like that and a lot of the countries we work in um, obviously are facing problems like poverty or um you know other other social issues so in indonesia that's um, quite high so we're trying to reach out to see what we can do that next year uh, which will be the focus of our, our projects overseas uh, and then we we often um run youth workshops um from time to time so we'll be doing that uh next year what we call um our redefining success workshop so basically getting young people involved in um looking at different ways of how they can go beyond just a career focus and get involved in the community. Um, instead of a lot of the time when you're in the corporate world, you either you focus on your career or you focus on your passion projects, but we're trying to bring those two together. And then we've been partnering with another um, nonprofit organization to develop the cross-cultural training day, where we get people from different cultures to connect with someone they might not have met before, learning about a new language or people group. And then kind of getting them all in the same room and, and sharing ideas and then getting them into the community so that they can share with others. So, so those are sorts of the initiatives that we'll be doing uh, coming up next okay. year. Um, so if someone like me, if I want to uh, get associated with Reach Across, so what are the steps, like what I need to do? Yeah, so there's a, a number of ways where people can get involved. Obviously, you know, if you're outside of Brisbane, we do have an online initiative that we launched last year uh, during COVID times called Solve Squad. So Solve Squad is basically um, utilizing what we call virtual volunteering. So a lot of people, uh, you know, during the pandemic, when it first started, uh, we realized they really wanted to volunteer, but they're either in quarantine or they're stuck in lockdown. You know, they can't move out of their homes or they're their suburbs where they're staying. Um, so we partnered with a range of organizations to develop everything from like online internships to work experience um, to paid professional gigs that you can do uh, virtually. Um, and also, you know, um, short courses that people can learn different skills online um, or, you know, different um, online competitions where people can, can get involved and get connected with other communities. So we post those online on our website from time to time. And we also uh, create unique experiences, especially for people who are like international students or who come from migrant backgrounds and they can't work full time or, you know, they have work restrictions. We connect them to our partners so that they can at least um, develop some new skills or um, do some training uh, with them and then basically get them referred to other companies where they can uh, develop their skills as well. So we try and connect it sort of like a matching process where people can list their skills online on our website and then we connect them to organization that kind of matches their profile and then um, create this unique experience where they can learn something new online together. So you work with um, migrants and refugees that have like come to Australia or New Zealand and countries like that right so mm -hmm. Um, you know, obviously being a migrant from a completely different culture in a completely different country, you would go through things like mental health issues or, you know, struggles to adapt to the Australian or New Zealand or American way of life. So tell us a bit more about what Reach Across does to help with migrant mental health and in that like intangible 
side of things? Yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, obviously mental health is quite a big challenge, especially for you know young people, kind of navigating, you know, how do I address sort of my internal perspectives of how I can handle pressure or you know, social concerns, things like that, but also from a personal perspective, how do I connect or share my experience with others mm -hmm. in a community that's so diverse and a society that, you know, doesn't understand, you know, certain issues that people are going through from a personal level. So um, at least from Reach Across perspective, we, we aren't, you know, psychological professionals, but we do partner with uh, people who are. So for example, uh, one of the organizations we partnered with uh, since I began in my role is called um, Arm Care, um, which is an acronym that stands for the Australian Refugee, uh, Refugee and Migrant Care Services Organization. Uh, so basically the founder is from a refugee background, she's South African, um, and she came to Australia and realized that a lot of refugees and migrants like her also kind of have these trauma and challenges from mental health perspectives. So she basically um, recruited a bunch of volunteer psychologists and um, she adopted this model where a lot of people are very um, apprehensive of going to psychologists and it's very clinical approach, obviously, when you, when you go into that environment. But she actually takes psychologists into the community where people need help and, and then basically um, caters the, the psychological assessment to, to the client's needs. So basically, um, we've been we've been partnering with them since the start of last year. Um, and one of the unique things about um, this organization is none of the psychologists charge their clients. Um, they do it 100% uh, free of charge. So any of the um, professional help that they get from psychologists or counselors um, is totally free. And we just obviously we want to do this as an extension of of our uh, outreach to the community. So that's kind of what got me interested at least in, in hearing people's stories. And then from a migrant um, background, it's a bit different to, to what many people see as just a mental health challenge because a lot of migrants, they obviously have this layer of, of the cultural mm -hmm. um, challenges that they have. So everything from obviously, you know, the generational conflict where parents don't understand the children, children don't understand the parents, there's that tension um, to obviously when it goes to their community, um, some people from a different generation might not understand what the younger generation goes through um, to, you know, there's unmet expectations or there's, you know, cultural pressures where everything from marriage to um, relationships, everything in between can add to the, the social burden that people feel. Um, to obviously peer pressure and things like that, which is common against, I, again, um, within society. So um, that's often compounded uh, within the migrant experience, uh, and especially from stories that we've heard from people who've come into our reach across offices to people who worked for us, uh, have gone through everything from um, depression to obviously anxiety and things like that. Um, but a lot of the times when they share about their experiences, it always comes back to their cultural um, their cultural roots. So I think, um, yeah, just hearing those stories um, obviously uh, pushed us to, to see how we can assist in creating a platform where, you know, we have these safe spaces where people can share their stories. Um, and we kind of come alongside people to see how we can connect them either to professional help or we can just create um, like um, assistance for them uh, where they can come with other young people and, and kind of share about their experiences. And then we kind of walk alongside them along that journey and see how we can support them um, in what they're going through. So, so that's kind of um, where we started um, in 2019. And then we've been kind of working with other organizations um, in the mental health space to, to see what we can do to provide training or services in that regard as well. Mm. So you know how you were saying that um, all the psychological help is free of charge mm -hmm. so does it get um is it like a government rebate or you know how do the counselors and psychologists get their payment for it yeah that's a good question so so the organization arm care that we partner with um it's comes under what the government calls the ndis so the national disability insurance scheme <laughs> Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, to your point, it does come under the national rebate. So all of the psychologists 
whenever they log their hours, they usually submit that to the NDIA, which is a overseeing body for this um, scheme. And then they get their rebate based on the hours that they work. So it, it was um, officially um, registered um, a few years ago. And then that's basically how um, we pay the psychologists. And then, you know, every time we go into the community, we obviously tell them, hey, this is a part of the partnership that we have with NDIS. Um, and you're obviously not obligated to, to enter in this, into this agreement, but this is how we obviously pay our workers. And, and a lot of people are quite open to it because obviously they've heard about the work we do or, you know, people have referred them to our services. So that's basically how we, we make sure that everyone's covered as well. Mm, I think that's really good that you offer that free of charge because these days, like, count, even a counsellor can easily charge over $100 for a one-hour session. And I can, I can just imagine, you know, a lot of migrants and refugees are not really always in the financial position where they can just spend $100 without really thinking about it. Um, and I know, like, you know, in New Zealand anyway, I've seen like a lot of refugees that come here and migrants, they struggle to, um, you know, culturally adapt to the New Zealand or Australian way of life. But then they can't really go and get professional help because everything costs money and they're kind of struggling as it is. And it's like, it becomes a vicious cycle. You know, they know they need help, but they don't know where they can get good help without it breaking the bank. So it's, yeah, really good that, you know, you've taken at least this one barrier away from them, or for them. Absolutely. Yeah, so, that's... Oh, yeah, you go. go ahead. Okay. Sorry, um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will go. <laughs> so, um, you, uh, we also came to know that uh, you are the 2020 Multicultural Ambassador for Mental Health Foundation. So how did you get that uh, opportunity and what does that role actually means? Yeah, so um, I got the role obviously at the start of 2020. Um, I heard about the Mental Health Foundation um, and, and the work that they were doing. And, and I noticed a lot of um, South Asians were involved in it, um, including the current uh, chairperson and the, and the CEO. So I was just really interested that um, a mental health foundation could be run by South Asians and especially people from different generations. So it's not like it was just a younger, younger uh, generation that was running it. There was people from, from you know, first, second, third generation who were involved in the organization. Um, and many people don't know um, that this particular organization is the, is the oldest running organization in Australia. Um, it's been around for, I think, just over 90 years. Um, so it's been going for quite some time. But um, I only heard about it, yeah, when obviously the pandemic started and a lot more people were asking questions about, you know, how do we handle mental health pressures, especially with the onset of a pandemic? Because all of this was kind of rising to the surface. More people were obviously um, addressing a lot of the mental health issues that, that people didn't want to talk about until, until this happened. So, yeah, when I first joined the foundation um, as an ambassador, they were basically had a call out for people from either refugee or migrant backgrounds um, to be multicultural ambassadors within uh, different cities across Australia. Uh, so in Brisbane, there wasn't many um, represented from obviously the, the suburb where I was living. Um, and so I, I basically applied and said, hey, there's no one here, but I, I, I'm happy to, to kind of be a representative for my location and see what I can do to help. Um, and then, yeah, got accepted around um, mid-2020. Mid and basically what a multicultural ambassador does is, you know, you go into the community and you talk to, the, to people. It's very grassroots. Um, and then we have, like, different forums that we were doing online, obviously, um, during 2020 because we couldn't do physical gatherings. Um, so we had, um, yeah, basically uh, young people consultations. We had... Uh, issue groups and then we had um, demographical groups within obviously different cultures so there was like a Indian Pakistani youth mental health um, call that happened once a month um, and then there was like a seniors group um, that met to, to talk about some of the challenges that they had with mental health so I really appreciated how it was kind of 
um, designated according to your, your obviously your demographic or your age group because I think different um, people go through different challenges at different stages of their life and sometimes young people for example might not want to share with the older person about the challenges because there's obviously that age gap um, so we did things like that and then we did obviously fundraisers like walk for mental health and then when there was um, world mental health week we had different people that we interviewed in the community to talk about things like that so um yeah it was it was really great to to be representing the organization uh, for 2020 and then i did it for for half of this year and, and got some other people involved uh, as well so we had basically like a youth ambassador program that we were expanding and then there was a multicultural ambassador program that i was part of and then we had other people in the community um, and also from local government who were involved uh, as well. And I think at one stage we um, we had the endorsement of the prime minister. So um, it got it got big really quickly, at least when I was involved. So it was really great to see that that recognition from you know different different um, levels of government, obviously local, state, federal. Um, but I was just really happy to be yeah representing my community, the South Asian community. And just getting other people involved so so it was a great great opportunity mm, and i guess you had a very interesting year that you were involved in it with obviously the pandemic um yeah. so like how do you think the pandemic affected people like how do you think it affected the youth and i guess you know it affected everyone in different ways um mm. what were some of the things that you observed and what were some of the things that you did um, in your capacity to help ease this pressure on people? Yeah, that's a good question. I think obviously mental health challenges affect everyone in different ways, like you mentioned earlier. I think the pandemic just kind of brought it to the forefront because a lot more people were open, or at least more open to talk about it because we were all kind of stuck. And we were all like, I, I like to explain the pandemic as uh, the great leveler because everyone was obviously experiencing the same issues. Everyone was stuck at home. Yeah. Um, people couldn't talk to their loved ones. Um, you know, there was that disconnect, and not only just from physical uh, connections with people, but people were cut off from their communities. They couldn't meet with their friends, obviously their family, um, if you were distanced um, physically as well. Um, so that all kind of added to the mental pressure that people were focusing on or, or were experiencing. And I think from cultural backgrounds, people were more, more open to talking about it as well because they saw everyone talking about it. Um, so it's not like, oh, I'm the only one experiencing this. So I think people were uh, emboldened uh, to speak about it and share about it with other people, even if um, they didn't necessarily um, want to do it before. So I think um, to answer your question, in terms of young people and their experiences, I noticed a lot of people at least in my role as a multicultural ambassador, were able to creatively express it in different ways. So instead of just, you know, having a conversation about it with someone else, they would write a poem or, you know, they'd, they'd record a video or, you know, they'd post a photo and say, this is how I'm feeling today. Um, does anyone want to talk about it or does anyone relate? So I think, you know, people were able to creatively express it. And as young people, obviously, social media really helped. Um, because you could kind of um, share your experiences and, and have that dialogue online, whereas mm -hmm. more anonymous. Um, and a lot of people who shared out their story, their mental health story uh, with us online when we had uh, initiative to do that um, as part of the Mental Health Foundation. Yeah, we got hundreds of, of entries and people were saying, oh, it's great to have a platform where everyone can share their story and not be judged about it. Um, so I think that kind of opened up people and conversations about mental health. And since then, I've also been encouraged to obviously share my own mental health story and obviously, you know, sharing with other people about it um, and seeing how we can kind of connect that way, at least from a cultural perspective, um, which I hadn't seen before the pandemic, at least on that scale. So, so it was a real encouragement to me, really encouragement to others in, in the South Asian community, which I've been a part of and yeah, it was really great to see that happen um, last year and kind of continue into to, to this year as well. Yeah, um, I would like to know a little bit about you. So where were you born? 
Yeah, so I was actually born here in, in Brisbane, uh, born and raised, but my parents are originally from South India, from Hyderabad. Okay. Uh, so I would often visit India every couple of years. Obviously, this is before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So it was really great, yeah, just going to India and, and obviously connecting with, with extended family. But I had never lived in India until um, 2015 where after my master's degree, I decided to go and, and live in India for myself, just to kind of reconnect mm -hmm. with my roots and learn more about my cultural upbringing, um, okay. which is the first time I had gone uh, solo by myself back to India. So I was working with a, with a nonprofit there uh, called Interso. Um, and yeah, I think that, yeah, I was living there really brought to light a lot of the things that I had kind of hidden for quite some time. Because in Obviously, growing up in Australia, there's a there's a lot of racism. So I kind of hid my uh, my Indian identity <laughs> under the layers of obviously being born in Australia and, and telling everyone I'm Australian. Mm -hmm. Until I went back to India, I didn't really embrace my Indian identity that much. So mm -hmm. relearned the language, obviously the cultural customs, the traditions firsthand. So that was really cool um, to just to be able to learn that and not have that parental pressure where it's like, oh, you have to embrace it but kind of having my own say in it and, and being able to experience it for myself. And it was even more um, heightened because um, I eventually met my wife there, who's Indian. Uh, she, was, she, was, uh, she was born and raised in India her whole life uh, in the village. And mm -hmm. I think being able to talk about it with her and not feel judged. And she was like, no, I, I understand what you're going through. Because she had moved from the village to the city where I was working in. So she had her own kind of learnings to... To process and we were able to do that together and then she eventually came to Australia um, after we got married end of 2019 early 2020 a few weeks before the lockdown happened in Australia oh, so she got in, lucky. yeah just in time <laughs> she got in just uh, a few weeks before that happened so I think that obviously the pandemic also contributed to kind of um, learning more about each other and just really appreciating you know our different upbringings and and being able to share share life together and mm -hmm. and learn together as a couple so yeah it's been it's been really great uh, actually coming up on our two-year anniversary this thursday so um yeah great. really excited yeah. about that yeah we survived <laughs> oh, okay but um yeah it's been it's been really good just to to learn more about uh, indian culture from her perspective but myself mm -hmm. in her shoes and and vice versa for her learning about australia mm -hmm. um, from me as well so it's been great yeah, coincidentally, Thursday is my birthday as well. Oh, wow. Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you mentioned that when you were raised in, as you were raised in Australia, there is a lot of racism and you had to uh, hide certain things within yourself. So how that has impacted your mental health? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think... It, it's impacted in different ways. Obviously, like I said, um, having that that racism or pressure from others to kind of identify more with my Australian identity than my Indian identity, it forced me to to kind of choose. And and a lot of people, especially from South Asian uh, upbringings, they're forced to choose either I have to embrace Australian identity and kind of let go of you know, in my language or my traditions or things like that. Or I have to choose to be Indian and, and kind of reject being an Australian, whatever that means. Um, so for the longest time when I was growing up, I, I chose to be more Australian. So obviously the accent that I have now, I would speak in my language and, and things like that. But that kind of changed um, in the last couple of years, obviously after I went to university and started to see, oh, there's people from different cultural backgrounds, people who are able to speak in different languages and, and um, seeing that as okay and acceptable and people actually valued the differences um, helped me to kind of embrace more about it. And obviously, like I shared before, going back to India really helped because I was able to see, oh, it's okay to, to identify yourself as Indian. And um, uh, there was one time in India where I, I learned the, the language so fluently that one of my coworkers I said, oh, you're more Indian than me. So <laughs> I think I was like, oh, well, okay, maybe I am Indian. So I think ever since that time, and obviously coming back to Australia and, and sharing my experiences in India, 
with with Australians, and they're just like, oh, okay, that's that's really cool that you've been able to kind of reconnect with your cultural roots. So that kind of put me at ease about being or well, identifying more as India as well. Mm, I can relate to you on that point where you feel like you're forced to choose. See, like I'm a New Zealand born Gujarati. My parents yeah. are, well, my dad is from India. My mom's also New Zealand born. And I feel like when I went to school, like, you know, I'm brown, but I have a Kiwi accent. So I was always yeah. more New Zealand than Indian, but I was Indian at home. But in public, I wasn't Indian. So I kind of get that thing where you, you know, you can't figure out the right mix. But then as you get older, you somehow just learn to like integrate the two together. Um, mm -hmm. And like that shame of being Indian, I think just got, starts to go away as you get older. Um, yeah, so I can relate to that on quite a lot of levels. Like whenever I go to India, because I can speak fluent Gujarati as well. And whenever I go to India, my family in India are just like, oh, you talk just like the people here. And I'm like, oh, okay. Like, you know, but it's a compliment. Like, yeah. Absolutely. So I think it's really cool that, you know, embracing your culture is very good. Um, I guess um, the last part of this interview that we wanted to cover is your other interests outside of Reach Across um, that I mentioned when I introduced you. So you're involved with the Youth Advisory Council for the United States Consulate General, um, also the World Economic Forum, um, Sari Collective, the South Asian Philanthropy Project, and you're also an online contributor for Black, the Black Lives Matter movement. So would you like to tell our listeners a bit more about any or all of these other initiatives you're doing? Because they're all pretty amazing things, you know, and I think people need to be more aware of them. Yeah, <laughs> where do I start? So, um, yeah, I, I think, like you mentioned, outside of work, um, I just like to kind of connect with my interests and see how I can obviously be more involved in it or learn more about it and kind of contribute to, to what I can do personally, at least from a personal level. So, um, yeah, uh, I got involved with, well, my latest involvement has been with the U.S. Consulate General. So one of my friends uh, had been serving with the Youth Advisory Council down in uh, in Sydney, and she had told me that uh, in, in Brisbane, they were just starting the Youth Advisory Council, which basically is a group of about 10 to 15 young professionals from different backgrounds um, who have either been to the U.S. or spent some time there or interested in foreign policy. <laughs> and basically advised the, the U.S. Consulate General, who is basically kind of the American ambassador here in Australia, uh, on, on matters to do with, um, obviously, youth engagement or uh, tourism or things like that from a cultural perspective. And I had spent two years living in, in Los Angeles when I was doing my, my master's in international development. So, um, yeah, coming back from the U.S., I was really interested about, oh, I wonder if there's a way I can kind of speak to my experience overseas. But... Um, still say that not every person who goes overseas is a tourist. There are some people who obviously want to learn different cultures and just experience life outside of Australia. And how can we kind of share those experiences with other young people who might be interested in doing the same thing? So, um, yeah, applied, got accepted earlier this year. And basically I've been yeah meeting with the ambassadors here uh, in Australia and, and basically creating different events where other young people can get involved and meet with the embassies in, in the local cities that they they, they serve in and, and kind of be a sounding board for the ambassadors here. Um, so we've done everything from talk about like um, how Americans are viewed in popular culture to uh, talking about, like you said, Black Lives Matter, um, because recently in America they recognized um, the slavery abolishment as the, the national holiday, um, which hadn't happened for, for hundreds of years. So yeah, talking about that, talking about racism and how we can kind of address that from a youth perspective um, has been a really great outlet for me uh, as well because I'm the only Indian uh, on the council. So, um, yeah, it's just been really great to, to have that representation and talk about my South Asian identity uh, with people outside of my culture. So, that, so that's been really great. Um, yeah, the World Economic Forum uh, is basically an international nonprofit network basically like for young professionals. So they have different young professional hubs in different cities. And basically every hub is called a global shaper hub. 
So um, anyone can get involved. Um, there's there's a, a young professional hub in every city in Australia, and they have they have um, some in in New Zealand as well, both in Auckland and Christchurch. But basically, every hub has to do a community project once a year, so a unique project where you give back to the community. So uh, here in Brisbane, um, we started uh, Arm Care, which is the, the organization that Breach Across partners with. So I'm on the board of Arm Care. And then we started uh, Solve Squad, which, which I'm also uh, running at the moment, which I mentioned is a virtual volunteering platform that we do. And then we've done some um, homeless outreaches with, with other nonprofits like Orange Sky and, and other organizations as well. So, so every year we try and focus on a different social issue and see if we can develop a project with other young people who can get involved in that. So, so I've been working on that since the last three to four years. So, so that's been a, a great way where I can kind of connect more with my passion and giving back to the community outside of Reach Across and, and have people who aren't necessarily part of the organization, but just have like-minded ideas or want to share, contribute as, as a collective. Um, and then, yeah, just been involved in other South Asian initiatives. So South Asians for Black Lives uh, movement uh, started in the States, but has kind of gone international. So I've just been the Australian uh, sort of representative since um, the George Floyd um, tragedy last year. And then, yeah, just um, getting more awareness for, for people who want to share their experiences about racism or, you know, supporting in solidarity the uh, African-American population here. So uh, obviously, like I mentioned, spending time in the U.S. and being friends with a lot of the people from the African-American community, but obviously having similar experiences of racism or, or just kind of standing up for, for people from other cultures um, who might have experienced similar experiences. Um, yeah, has been really uh, liberating for me and being able to share those stories openly um has been great so yeah um for me uh, as an introvert actually um being involved in a lot of social concerns or organizations um obviously it's, it's a lot of responsibility but i feel like it's the best way that i can kind of express myself in different ways and and for different platforms um so yeah just being able to do that in my own community from the comfort of my own city or my own home sometimes obviously when, when we've been in lockdown has been really great and kind of having conversations like this with other people from different cultures or young people who want to get involved and saying, hey, there is a platform out there for you. And then there are different interest groups that have started their own organizations and there's ways for you to get involved. And just kind of naturally connecting people that way has been a great, great way to get involved with, with other community causes. So, yeah, that's that's kind of been my journey and uh, still learning, uh, still connecting with other people. So it's been it's been a great year so far. And what does um what's your involvement with Sari Collective? What do they do? Yeah, so Sari Collective um started probably around two years ago. So they're a very new organization. So they're basically um what it stands for is an acronym, uh S A A R I, uh, South uh, South Asian Australians representing ideas. Um is what the, the collective stands for. So it's basically a new or emerging South Asian platform uh, where people, uh, South Asians within Australia, um, can kind of share their experiences growing up South Asian. So it's actually started by um, an Indian who was born in, in the States, uh, married an Australian, came, came to Melbourne as a lawyer, but then realized a lot of the reverse culture shock that he was feeling was um, also similar to experiences of Indians who had moved to Australia and obviously grew up here, like I mentioned earlier in our conversation, experiencing racism or not being able to relate to their fellow Australians and kind of share their experiences or having that connection with, with uh, the wider society. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, it's an online platform that uh, people can contribute to with their own personal stories. Um, I was actually one of the first um, writers to join the collective. So I connected with Sandeep, the founder, two years ago, and then we've just been kind of recruiting um, different uh, South Asians. So we've grown from just the, the two of us to uh, over 100 South Asians uh, now part of the platform um, from different cities across Australia. I think we have representatives in every state now. 
Um, and we just started physical gatherings, obviously, because restrictions are reducing. Um, so basically meeting in Indian restaurants and getting people involved um, over food, biryani, samosas, and just talking about life, um, talking about different cultural experiences and getting people involved in sharing their stories. So that's basically what Sari Collective is. And um, everyone who, who contributes their story to the platform obviously gets paid to do that. Um, and we've been funded by uh, other South Asian um, professionals and people who run their own organizations. So it's so an entirely community funded platform. Um, and we've just been really excited to see that natural growth over the last two years and still continuing to grow. So um, yeah, if you know anyone who's a writer or creative who wants to contribute, um, we have had other international people from other countries contribute as well. So um, yeah, if anyone's um, interested in joining, uh, the platform's open for, for, for anyone to get involved. Yeah, that sounds really cool. Um, so before we wrap up, would you like to give our listeners um, your social media handles and the websites of all these initiatives that you're involved in? So if any of our listeners want to find out more about these things, they can go and have a look. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I'm on Facebook, um, Instagram, LinkedIn, and it's just Joseph Colibri. Um so you can check me out there. Um, the website for Reach Across is, is just www.reachacross.org.au. Um, if you'd like to get involved in the Sari Collective, like I mentioned, it's just S-A-A-R-I collective.com.au. Um, or you can just email me at joseph.colibri at gmail.com. Love to connect. Cool. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Joseph. Um, it was really nice talking to an Australian because I lived in Australia, so I like to listen to the accent as well. <laughs> but it was really nice to hear about all the things that you're involved in. And like, it's amazing. We need more people to spend their spare time doing things like this. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. For having me. And for all our listeners out there, if you've got any feedback on this episode or any of our previous episodes, as always, you can get in contact with us on our Facebook page, um, which is Coconut Chats, or our Instagram page, which is at coconut.chats, or you can send us an email at coconutchats at gmail.com, um, and we will always respond to your feedback, and we're always looking for ways to get bigger and better so any feedback is appreciated until next time we uh, wish you well and take care everyone bye bye bye